Are we good to go? Yeah. Cool. Simon, how are you? Good on you, Carl. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Um, I, I wanted to uh, ask you some questions. You're, uh, you're pretty unique in the sense that you're the first um, uh, performance coach that I've ever come across um, in the UK or otherwise that works specifically with enduro and hard enduro riders. And uh, so I thought uh, I'd ask you if uh, I can pick your brains a little bit. You can tell me more about your world and maybe we can share it on my uh, YouTube channel and we can see where we go. So thank you. And um, so tell us a little bit about Simon. Tell us about your background. Tell us about how you, where you come from. How did you get into bikes? Anything you think is... Uh, where it started. Yeah, please. Well, Carl, thanks for having me. And you've been very kind and opened up some great rides for me in the UK being new here. So, so where it all started, it started in Natal for me. My dad is um, domicile. He's Swiss. And um, so he had a, a, a real love for riding and, and came over to South Africa, to the Roof of Africa. But I started off with motocross. And, uh, you know, I've still got some amazing friends from those days. Lance Isaacs, Grant Langston was in our year. We were never as quick as Grant, but he was, uh, he was in our group. Uh, Greg Minard, the mountain biker, Stephen Dyson. So we had a really strong collective of young riders. And, uh, you know, Wee 50s, Wee 80s, then onto the RM80s and KX80s. And so my, my grounding was motocross, and I love motocross. But... Uh, bigger than the usual rider and uh, <laughs> which wasn't obviously always very helpful. You're about 120 but, kilos or something, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, with, with kits, with kits. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, so my dad, obviously with his love for in Lesotho and Enduro riding, I grew up riding in Grayton with my dad and and I had a love for trail riding, you know, and, um, but MSA in those days, uh, you had to be 16 or over to have an MSA license to do enduros. So I could never, I never had the opportunity to do that. And then um, I successfully won the Natal Championship, uh, not because I always came first, just because I was always in the top five. The other guys were too fast, but they kept crashing. And I had a very, very big off in Ishawi. And um, just like that, I lost my confidence. I... I, I tried to do a triple jump and I cased it and guys went over me and I just got completely spooked. And I just lost my confidence and I was, I had a, you know, I was, I was a, being supported by a sponsor and, and uh, I just wasn't quite there anymore. And my heart wasn't in it and I was scared. I mean, I was being, generally I was fearful of, of riding and jumping. And so my dad wanted to get me into the, the enduro side, but obviously he couldn't get it because of the license. And then I basically just stopped riding. And, uh, you know, then boarding school and obviously sport and, you know, rugby, athletics, cricket. Um, athletics, only the shot put though, not the running car. So, uh, <laughs> um, so I had this grounding from a very young age with motorbikes um, through motocross and through my dad. And then I picked it back up again in my early 20s. Um, and you know, immediately thought, oh, I'll go to motocross. <laughs> and, uh, and I soon realized that, you know, I had a young family and I just realized that it's too high risk. I, you know, I had a chain of gyms in South Africa and you get hurt, you, uh, you, really, you really are in trouble. And I've already had a knee replacement. I've played, you know, played a very high level of rugby and um, that ended my career with my knee replacement. So I was a bit like, Simon, what are you doing? You know, you get a grip. And then I got into the enduro side and I just fell in love with it. I absolutely love enduro and extreme enduro. And then obviously with my dad's connection with the roof of Africa and spending so much time in Lesotho, the roof of Africa was something I'd always wanted to do. So in 20, when is it? 2011, I did my first roof. Um, I was on a Yamaha because most of the tall guys are the blood is blue, but I soon realized a week before doing the roof that uh, in electric start That's a might be my friend. <laughs> yeah. And um, I literally bought my bike a week before the roof and uh, rode it stock standard and uh, had an amazing experience. And, and it, was, it was tough. It was, you know, but uh, that got me into the extreme enduro. And then it progressed to, it progressed to a few more roofs and it progressed to 
going overseas and Romaniacs and and because of my background with professional sports and being an athlete myself with playing rugby uh, and having these gyms, um, you know, just by chance, just from riding with friends and guys started coming to me for help and, and it progressed. And the next thing I was, I was inundated with guys in the Western Cape that are very top riders. And then also it's just weekend guys that wanted to do events. So a combination of my life coaching skill set and my experience with exercise and training and, and supporting people online uh, kind of got this niche going for myself and before you knew it I had uh, every single the top five Western Cape riders underneath my belt and then you know I had a few South African champions and and my obviously my love for riding knowing what you need as an extreme enduro rider the strength and functional strength and my knowledge with exercise I became, uh, I added huge value to these guys because, you know, Carl, we, we love Extreme Enduro and I love your channel, by the way. I think what you're doing is so wonderfully authentic. It's real. We're passionate about the sport. We're weekend warriors. But we, you know, we just want to enjoy ourselves. And I see this with the Extreme Enduro guys that we spend so much more. I won't, I won't put the figure on because I'm sure some wives will be watching in on this, uh, on this video, but we spend a huge amount of money riding and a huge amount of money traveling and events and all these kind of things. But there is such a lack of spend on people on themselves and getting a coach or getting the right training program or investing in themselves on how to perform better. And I think when I started working with these riders, especially top riders, they saw the value that it, you need to actually invest in yourself. Instead of buying yourself a new pair of boots every three months, get a good trainer, get a good coach, work with someone that has experience, that's passionate about the sport. And the difference was in their performance was remarkable. I mean, I'll, I'll just share with you, for example, a guy I've coached for many years, a guy called Graham Hedgecock, who's a privateer. He's an amazing athlete. Um, uh, not a professional guy, but he's done, you know, top uh, top 15 uh, Romaniacs tours. He's done two Romaniacs top 15. He's done multiple roofs, and he's always up there. Yeah, no, I know. He came I've, to I've me. I've seen him, seen him around on, on social media and other places. So yeah, he's, he's incredibly, incredibly, uh, he's probably one of the hardest guys I've worked with in terms of mental toughness to train. He's incredibly mentally tough. But he came to me, and I'll never forget it. He said to me, it was day two, end of day two, Riff Africa, and he just couldn't hold on the bars. He's like, I just couldn't, and my hands were slipping off. I was just completely gone. So we did some basic testing, and he's got this inner drive, which is wonderful to have guys that you coach that are like that. But he did like 12 pull-ups. And I was, like quite, I was quite shocked. I was quite fat. And he was quite shocked. He's like, 12 pull-ups in a minute. It's like, I said, yeah, we've got some work to do. And he was exercising a lot he was cycling he was doing gym but but combining functional specific exercise with combining riding uh correct nutrition uh you know just guiding him properly not doing the same workouts putting yourself in different positions doing rider specific training i mean i would train guys with their helmets on mm. i would train guys with their boots on yeah and in in a space of three months he went to from from that very low score of pull-ups to 52 pull-ups and he started actually, he started actually started enjoying his riding because he was fitter, he was stronger, and he became more confident, even though he, his riding level was very high. Yeah. So, and then guys like Altus de Vette I've worked with, also incredible athletes, really good, great endurance, but no functional strength. David Thomas, same thing, you know, Dakar, very good enduro rider, Western Cape champion, but just no foundation strength. So it was quite interesting to see that specific functional training made such a difference to these guys and how they actually started enjoying riding more. Yeah. Um, yeah so that's know, how it started. I know the CrossFit world um, has become sort of very popular in the recent years. I know some people are starting to use CrossFit to promote functional strength and, and so forth. Um, but you know what you said earlier on about confidence, um, I want to dive into that a bit deeper because um, about 60, 65% of the guys that uh, come train 
with us at, at the, the training school, uh, what I do is every time somebody signs up for training, I'll, I'll give them a call or we'll, we'll chat on WhatsApp or, or Facebook Messenger and I'll say, what, what do you want to achieve? What are the things that you want to work on? What's your main gripes, issues? One of the things they almost always mention is, I just want to build confidence. These are anything on the spectrum from real beginners to intermediate guys, even to some advanced guys. Something's happened that has caused them to lose confidence or something is there that they, that they think they can do better had they, you know, if they had more confidence. So I suppose just that mental aspect of, 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 of knowing that you can, you can achieve something, knowing that you're ready to, to do it, that, that is surely a, a fairly important part of the, the whole process, right? A hundred percent. I think confidence, you know, time is an issue with a guy who's a privateer. And you've got you to, I first of all, tap into what the key objectives are, whether it's an event, how to get to the, you know, how to, how to map, it, map this, his, his program out that on come event time, he's 100% confident in his fitness, his ability. He's been tested. He's done some multiple day events. He's, mess, he's, he's played around with nutrition. Some guys like supplements. Other guys like food. So I know that when my rider gets to an event, that he is confident in his ability. And I think that's the problem what comes up is, you know, for example, the Roof Africa. It's very different to Romania because you're getting beaten up. You know, you get, it's, it, you know, rocks and you're getting beaten up and it chips away at your energy. I must say and I've done you, that race and it is incredibly tough. 8,000 feet in altitude. Um, the year we did it, it was 44 degrees Celsius, which coming yeah. from the UK, I've lived in the UK now for more than 20 years. That, that, that blew my mind. The amount of water that you lose, you're gasping for air. It's a very, very physical event on those rocks. So, yeah. I know, and I know. most guys and most guys don't get there slightly early and acclimatize. Yeah, yeah. Most I, I guys <laughs> just, you know, they fly in and it's like yeah. they're straight in and they got all the new kit and the new helmets and the new boots and but they they still have that fear. Yeah. And and for me it's around holistically helping someone. Nutrition, yeah. functional preparation, assessments, assessing ways, putting them through multiple day events of like six to nine hours. So he understands exactly what he needs to, what he's going to go through. So when he gets in those situations, he's confident that he can get through it based on his fitness, not his ability. Yeah. You know, yeah. a lot of, a lot of us, you know, especially riding in Romania coming from South Africa, the downhills are something we don't experience. <laughs> so like day one, you like, you know, you're going, you're actually going, are you actually joking? I mean, does yeah. someone have to ride down that? Yeah. And you start to question yourself. But if you're confident in your ability physically and mentally and nutrition-wise and your preparation, yeah. it makes it a lot easier to... And then you go down one, you think, oh, that's not too bad. And then make it steeper and steeper and steeper. Oh, yeah. So yeah. confidence is something... Also, is, I've worked with the guys that, especially younger riders... Um, that have had a big crash and they lose their confidence. And how do how do tap into why they're riding, why they're doing the the sport? It's a family sport, and they're with their dads and the moms involved. And and I think sometimes, especially a younger rider, loses confidence. And I've seen a lot of guys this, they they get lost out of the sport because the confidence gets lost, and they don't actually start enjoying it. It becomes a chore. It becomes too competitive. And they yep. feel vulnerable and they don't, you know, it's quite a macho sport. You know, yep. guys don't want to show any weakness or they yep. don't want to show that they are less than and, yep. and uh, they lose all confidence and it's, and it's guys, Luke, get, they stop riding. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yep. I've yep. seen that multiple times with guys I've worked with, especially uh, teenagers, early twenties, guys that are very talented um, that just take a complete different turn and go and do something else, you know? Um, yeah, but you yeah know, what I said earlier on is, is true, right? You, um, I think for a lot of UK guys, especially a lot of guys in hard enduro, when you said there's that, there's that, that, that big event, you know, uh, some guys will uh, that, they'll have that one event a year type of scenario where next year I'm doing Romaniacs, the year after that I'm doing the Roof of Africa. So it really is, it's such a big, uh, event that is taking place in many months from now 
and and to 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 get yourself into the frame of mind of preparing for that event you're going to spend potentially thousands of pounds or, or or dollars or euros to get there um you might as well direct a lot of your attention and your effort to yourself not only go to wales and ride my bike but there's a huge amount of stuff that you mm. can do while you're working day to day to aid in that goal right like fitness nutrition losing some yeah. weight thinking about the the skill type that you need to focus on on your way towards that particular um event you know so so carl one of the one of the coaching frameworks that i use with ceos with uh sportsmen that i've worked with from cricket players to rugby players and i've done this with extreme enduro riders obviously a little bit more you know the guys that are really at the top or ambitious to get to the top is developing your best and worst self and it's incredibly powerful and the guys that i've worked with that are you know they 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 comp they racing to place and the guys that are the weekend warrior it is extremely powerful what you know to use this tool of developing your best and worst self so in a nutshell without going into too much detail you identify all the things you don't like about yourself. You attach a character to that. That character represents a negative, your negative self. And you attach all the positive things about yourself. And you attach a character, a positive character to those words. But you close the loop with those two things by giving a five second rule. So a lot of guys, you know, you know what like Romaniacs is like. You get all roof, you get to near the end and it's like, I'm just done. I'm like done, and then the mental, the you know, the mind starts to bully the body, and you start to get into this negative spiral, or even before the round the houses or the prologue. By riders being able to switch into their best version of themselves, that character, you get a whole different energy, a whole different flow of how you approach the day. Your best version eats during he rides. He eats every ninety minutes. He doesn't lose his temper. He's calm with navigation. He's confident in his ability. And that tool that I've used for riders, as well as our cricketers and CEOs when they enter a leadership role, is I'd say it's one of the one of the one of the most powerful tools and strategies that I've used with riders and developing your best and worst self. Because you know, we just put the kit on and kickstart and go. It's like, and then you get into a difficult situation. You get into a, a situation where you go like, are you actually joking? And then there's a bottleneck and you start to lose your cool and you start to make mistakes. And every mistake you make is energy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then you stop eating and then it just snowballs and then you're playing catch up. Yeah. Um, and you and know what it's like. For us older guys, you know, you're already playing catch up as it is because by day exactly. three, you haven't recovered quite as much as the twenty-year-old uh, rider who 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 is potentially riding in your same class, you know. So, all those little differences that you can make, those little one percent increments, it all leads to potentially the difference between finishing, you know, or not finishing. Or for a guy yeah. who's racing to place, as you've just said it, a podium position or a non-podium position, you know. So I, I'll give you an example. David Thomas is a guy I've worked with for. A very very long time not only with riding but he is a very successful entrepreneur and i've worked with him on a corporate level and his first dakar he lost his brother tragically when he was uh, on his 30th birthday and they had this dream to finish dakar and and, and david is a 10-time western province enduro champion uh if he didn't go into corporate he i mean he could have been a professional rider no doubt anyway he embarks on dakar and uh, prepared, like really prepared, you know, that we've done everything. But he just had this kind of mindset he wants to place. And I just said, I said, it's dangerous. You're going to be out of your zone all the time. You're losing the experience and the joy of this, you know. And he, and he, did, a, he did very well at the Mizuga rally. And that obviously thinks, oh, you know, top 10. You know, top 10 mm -hmm. with the, you know, I can maybe come top. 20 in the Dakar, you know, it's like you start to get overconfident. And tragically on, I think it was day seven, uh, he, he was lying uh, like three minutes behind Sam and he was fourth or fifth on the stage. And it was a caution, 
uh, you know, I think caution two, which is obviously, you know, watch out. And it was raining, it was Bolivia, it was altitude, very high altitude. He was, he was almost falling asleep a little bit, but he was way out of his, riding way out of his, out of his level. And he had a massive crash. And you can see there's a video with Joey Evans actually getting to him and being put in the, in the ambulance, in the helicopter, tragic, you know, and yeah. hundreds of thousands of pounds raised and spent. And, but his ego took over. You know, he wanted to place. He, that was his, his whole motive was to place. And I see this kind of mindset with guys that are, have got talent, that have got a good understanding of their ability. And then they lose the whole experience because they keep going into that competitive mode and they don't lose the experience. And then David, I, I mean, his leg was a nightmare and got infected in, um, in Lima. And oh, he had a, I mean, he nearly lost his leg a few times. And uh, anyway, he, he redid it again the following year and he came, I think he was, I think he came top 30, but he enjoyed it. Yeah. He enjoyed the experience. He, he was always showing up in the best version of himself, you know, motivated by his getting his brothers at sick of his brother over the, over the finish line. He was very close to Errol Dalton, who was a also a South African legend. And that was his motivation. And I, I see a lot of these, these guys losing the, the why or the enjoyment of why we're doing the sport is yeah. to enjoy ourselves and to finish. Yeah, look, it's, it's an incredibly important point. Um, you know, you and I have been to Romania together um, on a trip that, that, I, that we genuinely enjoyed. And, you know, you, you contrast that with doing Romaniacs. Um, I've done Romaniacs twice, finished it twice, but I can't ever Thank say you. I enjoyed those races. <laughs> they, they, it certainly wasn't a word I would use to describe it. Um, yeah. You know, and... and Imagine if you could. Imagine if you could be so well prepared um, and you're and, and so within yourself that you do one of those events and you actually really enjoy it. You know, sometimes we tell ourselves we enjoyed it because we forget the bad stuff. That's how our brains work, right? But 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 it's true. Like if you can get into that mental frame of mind where you're so prepared, so confident, so ready for it, and then you race within your relative self, I think I think it changes the game because you'd actually think of it very differently. You know, and you'd experience. You know, I think, I think as well, Carl. I think that's a good point. But anyone who's watching here, and you ever goes on a trip with Carl, I want you to make it. Make I want to make it very clear that your chances of being on a three fifty four stroke, if you organise, <laughs> are very, very high. <laughs> so you're not going to get the weapon of choice. I just want to let you know that up front. This, this is what so, we do with you to keep you uh, to give to give you, uh, the least amount of chance of being up front. As we put you on a bike. <laughs> That's least uh, <laughs> adapted for the particular event. Um, but, but you, you, but you know, a stroke to drag 120 kilos up the hill anyway. So, you know. <laughs> with kit, huh? With kit. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, Carl, you know, we all have been in this, this race environment or these events. And then you, if you can just, for the guys listening to it, think about doing one of these events, whatever, which was Sea to Ski, the, uh, Sea to Sky, Romaniacs, the uh, MP, Roof. How many times do you just actually sit down and just check it out? You know, just check what's going on. Mm. The beautiful scenery, the places we get to on these bikes, it's yeah. just that's what we miss. And whether you're a weekend warrior or you're competing for a place, in, we don't enjoy the, the actual flow of the event, the highs, the lows, the challenges. It's just get to the finish line, get to the finish line, get to the finish line at all costs. And I, and I see this, and that's why there's such a need for coaches like myself, you know, who can help navigate people through this. And by developing their best and worst self, creating challenges for them and navigating them through this with knowledge and, and experience, it's invaluable to hire a coach. And, uh, you know, and look at a person that's going to give you support. He's going to help give you guidance. But I just see, you know, we, it's such an expensive hobby, you know, thousands of pounds for a bike, extras, kit. But then you ask a guy, what, did you, what have you done coaching-wise for your event? Now I've just mountain biked. I mean, it's, it's like yeah. the chance of you not enjoying your experience are very high. Yeah, or not even finishing. Like, you know, if, if, if yeah. you spend all the money and you're going to go all that way, wouldn't it be great if you could actually finish that event, but not only finish it, but finish it 
and I've actually enjoyed it and and remember the experience instead of riding yeah. without a head that's full of red mist, aiming just finish, 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 but you don't remember a single thing along the way, you know. And uh, then what happens is, you, uh, uh, we've all been guilty of this. And I've noticed you, uh, you, you just become observant of the guys that haven't prepared well, always arrive with the nicest kit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a correlation, is it? If you've got yeah. the, the newest, shiniest kit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're going to be fine. <laughs> so but watch I, out for I, the guy I, that's got uh, holes in his trousers, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But you know, one of the most joyful things I've got from working with these wide variety of characters yeah. and enduro riders is, is to see how my coaching framework and tools have helped them in their own lives. Um, Graham Hitchcock, for example, a very successful business. Is now, he's now a riding coach. Mm. You know, he's through mm. coaching him and working with him. He's now doing something he really loves. Um, getting people to the finish line that didn't think they could ever finish an event. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and, and using these frameworks in their own life, in their work life, in their family life. Uh, how do, and also, you know, Carl, managing expectations with family is, is a tough, because it's a time, it's a very time driven sport. Yeah. Um, so growth all around, not just getting to the finish line is, is a big focus of mine with all my, uh, all my clients, to be honest. So, so you're now in the UK, right? And you now work with UK clients. And are there yeah. any specific areas that you're focusing on more so than other areas in terms of either a sport, a type of a sport or a skill set or what, what, what are you currently doing exactly? So I, I am, you know, I've, I've, I've had quite a, an interesting life one day. Hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll write a book. Uh, having experienced a huge amount of trauma as a child, um, having a family tra tragedy where my, uh, my mom lost her life. And uh, unfortunately, my stepdad was the person that took my mom's life. So I've got a huge drive to help people. I'm obsessed about helping people and, and dissolving pain and suffering. So I do a variety of things, Carl. I've got clients going through relationship issues. I've got athletes doing Dakar. I've got someone who's transitioning from CEO to normal person. I've got someone who's about to get on a world stage as a as a cricket player, you know, I've got a wide rug at you know, clients who want to stop biting their nails, someone who wants to lose weight. But I think what I'm doing, what I do differently. And I think this is, if anyone is a coach out there and is listening to this, I really believe in delivering results based on what the client's requirements are. So, you know, someone who's doing an event, uh, it's an intensive process. People need access to you and you need to be available as a coach. So, Whatever the result is, I build a package which suits that client. Mm. I've got some, some riders that are, don't need constant access, so their package is different. I've got some people that are doing, uh, you know, a Dakar that need constant access, it's constant planning, they, their requirements are different. But the client comes first with me. Yeah. I'm different in the way that if somebody sticks to my coaching uh, framework and they and we agree on the terms of what the results need to be and they stick to it and they don't achieve it you know i know it's cliche but i i need to be motivated as a coach so i if people don't achieve their results i give your money back mm. and it, it motivates me to be on risk i like to work on risk because i'm also on the line here so it motivates me to get my whatever my client's doing whether it's corporate enduro to get them over the finish line or whatever the finish line looks for them Mm -hmm. And um, so it's not just, you know, do a session or chat to your coach and I'll see you next week. I believe you've got to be available and you've got to be results driven. And that's why I've had so many Romaniacs finishes, so many Roof Africa finishes, MP finishes, uh, C2, C2 Ski in South Africa, which is a different race, C2 yep. Sky. So in every single one of these big events, uh, even Erzberg, I've had a finisher. Um, at one year, Altus actually... Um, <laughs> He wasn't going to finish, but uh, one of my clients, David, was there and he'd broken a water pump and he was like, he was like, you know, he was just basically given up and David actually slapped him on the helmet and he ended up finishing. So I'm very fortunate that I've had finishes in every single top extreme enduro race, uh, except for, um, what's that nasty one, uh, 
is it Lagaris? That doesn't that one in Portugal. <laughs> so uh, hopefully, hopefully, someone listening here wants to do that. I'm, I'd love to get them over the finish line. So, so that's what I do in essence, Carl. It, it's quite bespoke, but it's uh, but, but also love for the uh, sport. Also, the regular guys, right? So the I, I so I know you work with all the the the, the guys who, who finish all these big races, but you, you feel this value in somebody, the weekend warrior, the uh, oh. Year old guy who wants to do Romaniacs, finish it for the first time in his life. Uh, born again biker, has got some big goals. He just wants to tick off a big event. You think those people can can benefit equally from from working with you? You know, Carl, it's not all about the events. Uh, a lot of guys come to me because it never started off with me coaching people to do events. It started off with guys just wanting to improve their conditioning, wanting to work with a coach that has knowledge, that loves the sport that they can, uh, they can ride with and he can push their bike up the hill. And <laughs> so the events come second, but I've noticed that guys, you know, the guys that are listening here are weekend warriors. Not everyone can afford to do a maniac, not everyone wants to do it because it's quite a painful experience. It doesn't have to be. Uh, and the roof of Africa and all these kind of things. But, you know, for uh, leaning on someone with knowledge, to improve your enjoyment and your fun of riding wherever you want to ride in the world. You know, we all guys that ride normally mountain bike, they're into fitness, they're into health. Um, you know, rely on an expert, rely on someone that's got knowledge, that's got a track record, that's worked with top people, that's worked with normal people and take them. I mean, I've got a client that uh, was just a weekend warrior. Uh, really improved his fitness, lost nine kgs, coached him around some stuff with work, and he ended up doing Romaniacs and bronze class, and he loved it and he enjoyed it. You'll never do it again, but you know he's he, that. That for me is progress. That for me is like you know to see someone start off just to get fit and healthy and improve their riding and such situ difficult situations to seeing them complete something uh, is, is 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 very special to me. Yeah, no, that's good. Cool, man. Um, listen, thank you. I think we've taken up uh, a huge amount of your time already. So um, how do people find you? Like, 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 where are you? Are you on social media? Are you, uh, how do they contact you? Anything like that? So, yeah, I mean, they can go to my website, which is simonschmid.co. Uh, just reach out to me on the website. And I normally, you know, just have a no obligation chat and just see, you know, not everyone um, is suited for, a specific coach so we see if there's a lovely fit if we can work together and uh yeah through my website really me at si sorry simon .co. that's my yeah. email address or they can email me me i'll put a link in the video description for people right. well, your if you want I'll, i can put your email address there but i'll put your website address there whatever right thanks carl and uh yeah appreciate the time man and appreciate the conversation and um it sounds good. I have a feeling um, that uh, as this whole thing progresses and we all come out of lockdown, there's going to be a, a bunch of highly motivated guys who want to get out riding. The events will all yeah. kick off. Um, I myself am entered for Sea to Sky, so I, I certainly have uh, I've been trying to keep my training up as much as I can. It's been tough sometimes to get motivated through this virus, but um, yeah, I think there'll be some guys that... Uh, that want to start taking some of that stuff a bit more seriously. So hopefully uh, they end up and uh, have a chat with you. So, yeah, Carl, keep up the great work. It's amazing what you're doing. It's authentic. It's real. I absolutely love what you're doing. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, very thankful for being on your, on your channel and looking forward to helping anyone that needs some help. Cheers. Thanks, Simon. Great. Cheers, Carl. Yeah.